Session 1-1 of KGLP 2021. The topic of Session 1-1 is challenges and opportunities of the peace process on the Korean Peninsula stage dialogue. It will be held in the form of a panel discussion. And the moderator of this session is Mr. Kim yeon Char, former Minister of Invocation. Mr. Kim yeon Char, please lead the session. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we will be holding a panel discussion on challenges and opportunities of the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. I will be the moderator for the session. We have invited five uh, panelists for this uh, session. In fact, uh, these uh, five gentlemen need no separate introduction, but I would like to take a moment to briefly introduce them uh, to our viewers. First of all, we are joined by Moon jong in chairman of the Sejong Institute. Uh, Mr. Moon is a special advisor to the President for Foreign Affairs and National Security. Uh, he is uh, uh, very well, uh, has abundant experience. And then uh, we are also joined by uh, Lee jong Sok, former Minister of uh, Unification. Uh, as you know, he is a leading uh, North Korea scholar, and during the Noh Han administration, he oversaw the six-party talks. And uh, we have uh, three guests uh, from abroad. Uh, first of all, we are joined by uh, Ning Fu Kui, who is the former Deputy Special Representative for Korean Peninsular Affairs of China and the former Ambassador to the Republic of Korea. Uh, he played a pivotal role in the six-party talks uh, in the past. And from Russia, we are joined by Alexander Zebin. He is the director of the Center for Korean Studies at the Institute of Far Eastern Studies. Mr. Uh, Jevin uh, covered uh, the Korean Peninsula issues for a Russian media, and he is a leading uh, Russian researcher on North Korean issues. And uh, we are also joined by Mr. Joseph Dutrani, who is a former special envoy for six-party talks uh, with uh, North Korea. And uh, he also served as a uh, director of the uh, intelligence, National Intelligence uh, Alliance. And uh, now with our guests, we will talk about the challenges and opportunities of the Korea peace process on the Korean Peninsula. I would like to give each panelist about 10 minutes to offer their comments and thoughts. I would like to first invite uh, Chairman Moon Jong-in for his comments. May I take uh, off my mask during my comments? Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Korea peace process is a process of uh, building peace. The peace process itself is not an end state. So I would like to highlight that uh, the peace process sees a peace as a process. And uh, this was proposed by President Moon Jae-in. The goal of this process is very clear. It is to achieve a nuclear weapons-free, peace and prosperous Korean peninsula. Uh, this is the ultimate goal of the Korea peace process put forth by the President Moon Jae-in. And uh, the initiative for the peace process is guided by three principles. First is no war. Uh, the primacy of peace is the first principle that guides the peace process. The second principle is the no nukes process. Uh, this is a commitment uh, to honor the denuclearization declaration. The third principle is the no regime change principle. Uh, presi the president at uh, Berlin gave a lecture and clearly stated that uh, the South Korean government was not interested and did not have the capability to overturn the regime in North Korea. So the third principle that guides the Korea peace process is no regime change. 
And uh, I think that there were four strategies that uh, support these three principles. The first strategy is the peacekeeping strategy. This is about preventing war on the Korean Peninsula. What falls under the peacekeeping strategy is strengthening military deterrence and also strengthening the Korea-U.S. alliance, thus uh, preventing any spontaneous war from breaking out on the Korean Peninsula. I believe that the peacekeeping strategy became even firmer after uh, the crisis uh, of 2017. I believe the Korean peace process uh, bears more meaning because it goes beyond simply preventing war on the Korean Peninsula to build peace, and that it relates to the second strategy of peacemaking. Peacemaking uh, has to do with reducing inter-Korean military tension and confidence building in the short term and uh, transforming the armistice agreement into a peace accord, adopting an end of war declaration, and building a lasting peace regime. Um, and it is a two-track approach in that uh, the South Korean government aims to build peace uh, while pursuing denuclearization. And there was some progress because uh, we saw the Panmunjom Declaration and the Pyongyang Declaration coming out, and those two documents uh, highlight uh, the spirit of the second strategy. The third strategy is the peace building strategy. Under this strategy, as uh, said by Immanuel Kant, is to eliminate the structural cause of uh, conflict and war. But because we cannot achieve unification overnight, peace building refers to a process of fostering peace through economic exchange and cooperation. And under this uh, strategy, Korea aims to reconnect railways and also build uh, networks uh, that connect the two Koreas. Uh, under this strategy, Korea aims to build a peace economy first. and. Uh, if we build a peace economy, then the risk of uh, war between the two Korea diminishes and the possibilities of unification uh, increases. And uh, the fourth strategy is uh, proactive diplomacy. As you saw in the case of Afghanistan, the Afghanistan government relied everything on and depended everything on the U.S. And the South Korean government uh, uh, seeks to pursue proactive diplomacy. Uh, they want to, we want to take uh, more initiative and take the lead in terms of engaging in diplomacy uh, to prevent war on the Korean Peninsula and also to build peace on the Korean Peninsula and achieve denuclearization. So the idea is for the South Korean government to take on a more leading and a bigger role. Uh, let's take a look at what happened. In 2017, as you know, uh, that year was a year of acute crisis. North Korea conducted 15 ballistic missile tests and six nuclear tests. And in the U.S., President Trump alluded to military response. Uh, uh, he, uh, at the U.N. General Assembly, said that uh, he could alienate North Korea, and tensions were quite heightened on the Korean Peninsula. Of course, in 2018, with the Pyeongchang Olympics, uh, the mood changed uh, dramatically. Uh, the Panmunjom uh, summit was held in April 27th uh, in 2018, and the Panmunjom Declaration came out, and also the Pyongyang summit was held, and there was also a declaration coming out of that summit. And uh, according to these declarations, the two Korea agreed to a new start uh, to build peace. And of course, this won the support of the Korean people and the international community. So 2018 was actually a year of great hope. And then in 2019, uh, the stalemate begins, uh, in particular, the DPRK U.S. Hanoi summit uh, fell apart, and North Korea started to close its doors once again. It uh, severed uh, dialogue channels with South Korea, and it has not accepted U.S. calls to return to the dialogue table. And recently, the IAEA issued a uh, report that says that North Korea has restarted its uh, Yongbyon facility.
we can uh, think about uh, what went wrong. And I think uh, the biggest deal breaker was uh, the Hanoi summit. At the time, at the Hanoi summit, the U.S. pursued a big deal or no deal. Uh, they demanded that uh, North Korea uh, abandon its nuclear weapons, and uh, they guaranteed North Korea a great economic future if they dismantle uh, their nuclear weapons. On the other hand, the North Korea pursued a small deal in that uh, they offered to dismantle the Yongbyon a nuclear facility in exchange for uh, the lifting of some sanctions. And uh, you can see that there was a great gap between the positions of the U.S. and the DPRK. And uh, this frustrated uh, Kim Jong-un greatly. And in fact, for Kim Jong-un, he lost a lot of uh, trust uh, and confidence. His people lost a lot of trust and confidence uh, in their leader. And uh, this led to North Korea uh, closing its doors once again. And in October 4th in 2019, uh, in the working level talks between the DPRK and the U.S., Kim Jong-un was quite clear They stated that they will not return to the dialogue table as long as the U.S. remains uh, hostile to North Korea, and they maintain this stance uh, to this day. And in 2020, the situation has gotten worse. Uh, Kim Yo-jong uh, issued a statement saying that uh, South Korea and North Korea were uh, in hostile relations, uh, she cited uh, the distribution of hostile leaflets, and they terminated all channels of communication. And then in June last year, North Korea demolished the joint liaison office within the Kaesong Industrial Complex. And the South Korean government really did not spare any efforts to uh, revive the situation. So why is uh, North Korea maintaining this stance? Well, North Korea is facing a lot of internal struggles with the COVID pandemic and the sanctions. And uh, this year and last year, North Korea experienced a lot of natural disasters. So for North Korea, it does really not have the luxury to engage with the outside world at this point. Uh, it is focusing on maintaining order and uh, control within. And the North maintains that the Biden administration has not proposed uh, specific or concrete uh, incentives. Uh, the U.S. is simply calling on the North to return to the dialogue uh, table. But for North Korea, uh, they need to have some tangible outcome from uh, the talks. And this is quite burdensome for North Korean officials. So the North Korean officials, in order to engage in working level talks, must have something concrete, uh, concrete achievements. And also there's a lot of uh, distrust uh, among uh, North and South Korea as well. North Korea believes uh, that uh, South Korea has not delivered on its uh, promises and commitments. Uh, they believe that there were three uh, summits and uh, nothing has uh, been actually implemented. So there's a lot of complaint, there's a lot of distrust against uh, South Korea. And from the perspective of the U.S., uh, the U.S. needs North Korea to take a bold step in order for uh, the U.S. to make a bold offer. And the U.S. maintains that the North needs to come to the dialogue table and explicitly uh, clear up what their demands are. From the U.S. position, they are maintaining the maximum pressure and the sanctions. And of course, the North has a problem with this. And uh, the U.S., while maintaining pressure and sanctions, says they are willing to negotiation. If you look at uh, what the U.S. officials are thinking, I believe that uh, they want to manage the situation in North Korea stably. And in order to do that, military deterrence is uh, very important. Uh, the alliance with Japan and South Korea is very important. 
And I think in the current Biden administration, uh, the North Korea nuclear issue has lost uh, its uh, stance as a priority. And uh, Moon Jae-in, uh, President Moon Jae-in is trying to look for a breakthrough, but uh, it's not easy. The Korean Peninsula has been divided for 70 years. And uh, it's difficult uh, to build a peace regime overnight on the Korean Peninsula. There will be many challenges. And I feel that the Korean peace process is a step in the right direction. I think the challenges we face now are uh, not new. We have faced these challenges uh, before. And so that is why all the more we need to improve relations with North Korea. And we also need to form a national consensus. And we also need to more closely consult with the US. I think the direction itself is uh, ideal. But I don't think that we have been able to overcome the challenges at hand. But I think that even with a new government in uh, Korea, this trajectory towards uh, peace building uh, will continue. Thank you. Uh, Chairman uh, Moon Jong-in uh, talked about uh, what has happened during the past few years in dialogues with the North. And he talked about some of the key elements and components of the Korea peace process. Next, we would like to invite uh, Mr. Alexander Seven for his comments. You have 10 minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the uh, Ministry of Unification for inviting me to speak at this very meaningful and important conference. And I'm also glad to meet uh, my old time friends and colleagues whom I met at various uh, conferences and forums before. Uh, um, everybody almost agree that uh, Korean uh, settlement, Korean issue has two aspects, international and domestic. I speak firstly about international aspects of peace process. Problems and difficulties we encounter time and again in the process of settlement of the nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula, make us to uh, conclude that without solution of a certain key problem directly related to the region's future security architecture as a whole, we will continue incessantly stumble on minor problems if we will be not capable to tackle them. The fundamental issue which any peace process on the, in Northeast Asia and on the Korean Peninsula should resolve, including democratization and reunification of Korea, should address two, is finding an acceptable for four big countries, United States, China, Russia, uh, and Japan, place for reunited Korea in the future security architecture in Northeast Asia. Short of such vision, each and every participant of any future settlement will remain very suspicious about other intentions and plan. It is an open secret that many politicians and experts in the United States, Republic of Korea and Japan believe that denuclearization of North Korea will finally bring about emergence of reunited Korea as a member of tripartite alliance, United States, Japan, Republic of Korea, for such reunited Korea had been already assigned a mission to retain United States military presence on the peninsula and to play a role, I quote Victor Chan, a global partner of the United States in world affairs. But it is highly unlikely that such development, such vision will be welcomed in Moscow and Beijing. Both countries are likely to perceive such triangle as a deterrent against Russia and China. Such an alliance would be tantamount to emergence on Russia's Far Eastern borders in nation, a nation clone of NATO. The, Plans to use reunified Korea as a de facto a forward base of maritime powers, the United States and Japan against continental China and Russia can hamper is already hindering the solution of the nuclear problem 
establishment of comprehensive and sustainable peace system in Northeast Asia and the reunification of Korea itself. Exactly absence of joint mutually acceptable vision for both Koreas or for a united Korea place in the future security architecture in Northeast Asia remain a major reason for drastic lack of coordinated actions by United States, China, Russia, and Japan in resolving nuclear issue and ensuring a sustainable peace process on the Korean Peninsula. It is high time to accept that the problem exists and the above mentioned four big countries together with both Koreas should launch a second track dialogue for relevant discussion on the issue. Concerning the domestic or internal uh, uh, issues and challenges to Korea peace and process, I would like to mention that Lessons of German unification, a regime change scenario imposed by some countries on the Balkans, in Iraq, Libya, and Afghanistan, alarmed North Korea leaders. Unless the North Korean elite would be provided with a clear guarantees of their personal safety, adequate social status, and a certain level of well-being after unification, it would be stay very united and remain very reluctant to open this country and to abandon nuclear weapons. Only inviting in honest North Korea to participate in bilateral and multilateral economic projects in Northeast Asia, including those proposed by Russia, can convince Pyongyang that international community has taken on a road leading to North Korea general uh, gradual integration in existing political, international, economic order instead of launching on the country a regime change scenario. Besides, economic cooperation will help to develop North Korea economy, to make North Koreans more prepared to live in a modern society. In other words, it will help to lessen the existing gap between two parts of the country and to cut down unification costs. During the process, it will help to enlarge North Korea ever-growing strata of people interested in stable relations with the outside world. To, so to, to ensure sustainable process of peaceful co coexistence and economic cooperation remains a major challenge in inter-Korean relations. Some unex un unfortunate experience. A major lesson uh, that could be drawn from the history of the Korean settlement is that priority given to some countries to pressure and sanctions in order to make North Korea to disarm has proved to be wrong. It is impossible to deny that the course had failed to achieve the denuclearization of Korean Peninsula. On the contrary, when faced with such an attitude, North Korea during 2006-2017 period conducted six nuclear tests and after several unsuccessful attempts launched two satellites. The country has become de facto a nuclear missile power. A history of imposing sanctions against North Korea makes one recollect a famous saying uh, on futility of attempts to do the same thing and expect a different result. Meanwhile, experience of dealing with North Korea testifies that, Kore that excessive pressure and coercion had led in majority of cases to greater suspicion and hostility. While engagement and respect for certain positions shaped by history legacies uh, brought about cooperation and compromise. If the military option is excluded, any political solution will be not possible without certain compromises. Calls for North Korea to take practical steps towards denuclearization would look more convincing 
if they were accompanied by definite unilateral and multilateral commitments by the nuclear powers about her security and her right to develop peaceful nuclear program. In the meantime, North Korea is presented with a huge pile of requirements, along with very vague promises that are supposed to flesh out only after it completely disarms. The mutual respect for legitimate concerns of the parties involved in the field of security and cessation of economic blockade of North Korea would make two absolutely essential elements of any future compromise. And finally, as I see, tasks for the Koreans. Frequent and rather long breaks in the negotiation process on the nuclear problem provide South and North Korea with a unique chance through their own combined efforts to size leadership in removing threat of war, promoting peace and common prosperity. Three inter-Korean summits of 2018 confirmed that inter-Korean dialogue has all chances to become, to become a major channel for promoting security and stability on the Korean Peninsula. The dialogue is vitally necessary to improve the current uneasy situation on the peninsula. The best option for the Koreans would be to resume working on implementation of bilateral agreements reached by their leaders at the inter-Korean summits and talks held during the several, several previous decades, including those agreed upon in 2018. I doubt strongly that these days anybody would dare to challenge openly any inter-Korean accord aimed at reconciliation and peaceful cooperation. It is high time for the Koreans to take their own destiny to their own hands. Russia hopes that unified Korea will become her good neighbor and major economic partner. Emergence of such an actor in the region is perceived as favorable for Russia, both from security and economic point of view. Russia's foreign policy concept approved in 2016 states that, I quote, Russia is interested in maintaining traditionally friendly relations with democratic people republics of Korea and Republic of Korea and will seek to ease confrontation and de-escalate tension on the Korean Peninsula as well as achieve reconciliation and facilitate inter-Korean cooperation by promoting political dialogue. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. That was an insightful comment by Mr. Alexander Zebin. So in making progress for inter uh, North Korea nuclear talks, he talked about the importance of economic cooperation and also the importance of inter-Korean relations. Next. Mr. Lee Jong-suk, the former Minister of Unification, if you would. Yes, it's very nice to meet you. So, Mr. Ning Fukui and Mr. Dichrani and I have talked a lot about North Korean nuclear issues, and that was 16 to 17 years ago already. But even today, we have not made much progress, and we are still talking about the same thing. So, it's great to meet both of you, but it saddens me to say that we have not made much progress in this issue. So yesterday and day before yesterday, we talked about how the nuclear program has been reoperated at the Yongbyon nuclear complex, which raised concerns among the Korean public and also other countries as well. So from the viewpoint of an expert, this was expected event. As you know, North Korea has suspended its nuclear tests and test launches of ICBMs. With progress of denuclearization talks, it said it will suspend such progress, and although denuclearization talks is not in progress since 2018 in April, North Korea has upheld its promise. And within that promise, 
included is the cessation, but it not included in the promise is the cessation of the nuclear reactors at the complex. So after the launch of the Biden administration, uh, you know, it's been trying to engage in various talks with North Korea. And if North Korea ultimately were, if it will not continue provocations, it would be very difficult to engage in talks and negotiations with Nor uh, North Korea. So we would have to model through and perhaps it gives us some sort of a perception that it's adopting Obama administration's strategic patience. So given this, I mean, from North Korea's viewpoint, we di did have a North Korea-US summit, and it has suspended uh, nuclear tests for a long time and also suspended operation at Yongbyon nuclear complex. And that was all for the lifting or relief of economic sanctions. But with that not realized, the economic sanctions not being lifted, for North Korea to resist against doing ICBM tests and nuclear reactors, you know, it shows North Korea's stance, at least at a lower level. And uh, the resumption of operation of the Yongbyon nuclear complex is a provocation by North Korea, which is outside of the promise that it has made before. So the denuclearization negotiations between North Korea and U.S. is direly needed at the moment. And the U.S. government and the Korean government say that actually North Korea is not the one who is coming to the table. But, you know, we have to go beyond our subjective point of view and look at the situation from an objective point of view to see and identify what the problems are and what needs to be resolved. That is what we need at the present moment. And given that, how can we resume talks for denuclearization? So in principle, I guess we could say that uh, we could talk about two things, something that you already know. So basically, the, there needs to be an alleviation of mistrust between the U.S. and North Korea. Unless there is an alleviation of mistrust, whether it be a big deal, you know, Trump, President Trump, the former President Trump said, you know, he will carry out this big deal strategy. And I thought, you know, maybe it will work and maybe it will not. And I applauded him for it, but it turns out that it really wouldn't work because how effective would a big deal be when there is still a deep mistrust between the two parties? How can we have an in-block exchange of what each other wants? Therefore, we need to build trust. This was a lesson learned. And also, so once there is North Korean provocation, usually what we do is we issue UN Security Council resolutions and slap sanctions. But just because we slap and strengthen sanctions, North Korea has never succumbed. As a matter of fact, the sanctions actually reinforce North Korea's nuclear capability and increase the number of nuclear tests. So and all the base of all that is mistrust. So what we really need is trust. I know I'm talking in principles right now, but we need to resolve this issue based on trust. So how can we build a trust? So we need to take actions and alleviate mistrust, which will lead to further actions and so on. So it's simple but true. That how would we do that? How would we engage in negotiations? So North, the U.S. wants North Korea to give up its nuclear program, and North Korea wants relief of economic sanctions from the United States. Of course, you know, like uh, guaranteeing or assurance of security regime on North Korea, that actually means that he wants economic sanctions relief when it talks about the uh, United States assurance of a stable security of the regime. So Kim Jong-un is focusing on economic development and for that he wants the sections to be relieved. Or Therefore, that's what North Korea wants the most. Then how would we go about with negotiations? 
So of course the two parties want negotiation. However, what we need for negotiations is our willingness and courage to give North Korea what it wants. However, the United States has a trauma or rather has a fear about lifting North Korean sanctions because if it lifts just a bit of uh, sanctions, then we would have to keep relieving sanctions over and over and over again. And then if North Korea were to kind of pretend that it's denuclearizing but halts the process in the middle of it, then the U.S. gave but received nothing in return. So there is, again, that mistrust issue. So the U.S. says, you know, if North Korea takes some practical or concrete steps towards denuclearization, then we will relieve sanctions. And so we were not able to resolve that mistrust issue once again. Then how can the U.S. authorities uh, relieve their fear of lifting sanctions. This is not an easy task, but it's snapback. So there's nothing else, no other further options than a snapback. So as you know, North Korea and the U.S. and North Korea and the international community would have to exchange things with one another. We need to take corresponding measures with regards to North Korea's denuclearization steps, like lifting of sanctions. And maybe finally, North Korea would ultimately say, hey, I'm not going to denuclearize and show its true color, but that's the worst possible scenario. And we would restore the sanctions that were lifted once again. So snapback is actually not uh, something uh, that is negative for the United States because all the United States has to do is to lift sanctions, but North Korea actually has to take steps towards denuclearization, for example, dismantling of the Yongbyon complex and ultimately uh, do away with its missile program. So for North Korea to engage in a step-by-step -step exchange with the United States is all about dismantling facilities, which is irreversible. So in that perspective, snapback is actually favorable for North Korea. So I would say that uh, snapback is something that the U.S. needs to consider. That's what we argue for. Then at the initial phase, how are we going to organize that? I believe that the initial phase is not going to involve a small deal. It's going to involve a big deal. Because uh, the key to first step between North Korea and U.S., well, we cannot do something completely new. So North Korea says, you know, you know we will do this and that if uh, the United States relieves sanctions. And the U.S. also s has said that if North Korea takes steps towards denuclearization and so shows sincerity, then we will take such and such steps, especially uh, the democratic government. So the two parties have suggested uh, these various uh, measures and items that they want, and we would have to collect them all together and put them forth. So at the Hanoi summit, North Korea proposed something to the United States. I'm sure you know about this already. Mr. Moon already talked about it. And also during the joint statement, Kim Jong-un suggested or proposed things to President Moon Jae-in. And then what does the U.S. want from North Korea? So the traditional interest of the Democratic Party is, as we've seen in the agreed framework, uh, the freezing of North Korea's nuclear program by so freezing would be an achievement if realized uh, by the Democratic Party of the United States. So that's their traditional interest. Uh, North Korea already promised that it will completely renounce its Yongbyon nuclear complex and at the presence of U.S. experts, it will dismantle uh, the complex. Then, actually, President, former President Trump said during the Hanoi summit, or rather 
indirectly said that Yongbyon nuclear complex is not that important, relatively speaking, but look at it this way. We are concerned about the resumption of nuclear reactors in Korea. And where does that happen? Yongbyon nuclear complex. And for the past 20 years, North Korea has conducted nuclear tests, which put our people in fear, and it reinforced its nuclear capability. And we saw all the signs for the past 20 years. And this and we saw tensions rising on the peninsula because of that. And everything is related to the Yongbyon nuclear complex. However, what does the United States say? Yongbyon nuclear complex is not that big of a deal. Yeah, it's cheap deal. But we know it's not a cheap deal. We are still worried about Yongbyon. So as uh, Dr. Siegfried Hecker said, Yongbyon nuclear complex uh, plays a pivotal role in North Korea's nuclear. Uh, program, and we need to recognize that. And the United States administration has always been interested in freezing of North Korea's nuclear program. And with regards to the inspection program, problem, I think that needs to be realized in the next phase. First of all, we just need to uh, accept uh, North Korea's proposal on like uh, that it will dismantle or freeze and so and so items related to a nuclear program. And inspection will come later. And in 2019, in Hanoi summit, five North Korean sanctions against civilian economy that were adopted in 2016 uh, was uh, would be lifted. That was the United States proposal. And plus, if North Korea freezes its nuclear program, North Korea, uh, South Korea and China and Russia and the United States would provide energy support to North Korea while the program is frozen. And I think that would be great for the first phase or the first step. So North Korea and uh, the United States have shown willingness to do this to some extent. Uh, if we are to relieve the fear that the U.S. officials have with regards to North Korea with snapback, I think this would be feasible. And, you know, China, Russia, and North Korea are, n are supportive of snapback. As a matter of fact, North Korea does not mind this snapback, I believe. So I believe there's no other option than snapback. And afterwards, we would take further steps towards denuclearization and relief of sanctions. So further exchanges will be made in later stages. And the last thing I'd like to mention is, will North Korea give up its nuclear program? No one can give us a concrete answer. But what is certain is that to date, North Korea has focused uh, solely on building its military power. So while maintaining its national strategy, uh, nukes uh, were essential. However, as you know, in 2018, the military first uh, national development policy was changed into economic first, and all the resource distribution were shifted from building military power to economic power. So for economic development, because that's the top task for Kim Jong-un regime. So denuclearization and the lifting of sanctions are essential for economic uh, development, and North Korea knows that. That's why it came to the table for talks recently. So North Korea in the past had the notion that it needs to absolutely possess nuclear arms, but that has changed. And for economic development, will North Korea really give up nukes entirely? I don't know. But for North Korea to realize economic achievements, sanctions need to be lifted, and for that denuclearization talks is critical. And North Korea knows that. So depending on how and China and Russia negotiate with North Korea would impact North Korea's uh, renouncement of its nuclear program. So the other parties, the US, Russia, China, all need to play a role together in 
dismantling North Korea's nuclear program. I believe they hold a key for the future that we want. So for North Korea to abandon its nukes, we should not give up on uh, uh, negotiations, and we should opt for snapback. That's my comment. Thank you. Former Minister Lee jong se said that for the resumption of negotiations, we need some principles, especially alleviation of trust and uh, some things that needs to be exchanged for the alleviation of sanctions. Uh, he talked about some items that needs to be in this uh, nuclear negotiation package in detail. And he also emphasized snapback method to create a breakthrough in this matter. And this is something he emphasized that we need to closely examine. Next, uh, Mr. Ning Ku Fui, please. Let me begin by thanking the organizers for the invitation to this forum. Although I am no longer in the front lines of diplomacy, I continue to take interest in the situation on the Korean Peninsula. Today, I will speak about the opportunities and challenges that have risen on the Korean Peninsula, from the breakdown of the North Korea-U.S. Hanoi summit to the inauguration of the Biden administration. I took part in the Korea Global Forum for Peace in 2018. At the time, there was optimism that the issues on the Korean Peninsula would be politically resolved. However, talks have been stalled since the North Korea-U.S. summit in uh, Hanoi broke down. Therefore, it is necessary to look back on the experience and lessons of the Hanoi summit. And I think that this will be immensely helpful to resolving the issue on the Korean Peninsula. On the surface, the Hanoi summit fell apart because the two parties' demands were incompatible. Uh, for instance, uh, they had a different idea in terms of the sequencing of the give and take. However, a closer look shows that, in fact, it stemmed from a difference in awareness. The essence of issues on the Korean Peninsula is one of security, and the fundamental cause is that still Cold War-like mindsets prevail on the Korean Peninsula. The basic direction towards solving the nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula is to consider the reasonable interests of all concerned parties, which includes North Korea, and build trust based on a simultaneous and phased approach. I think that perhaps I am in line with uh, former Minister Lee jong Hawk mentioned earlier. However, this principle was not realized during the Hanoi summit. There are positive elements uh, to the Biden uh, administration's North Korea policy. However, it still lacks novelty and substantive changes. I would like to emphasize once again that we need to take note of the reasonable interests of North Korea instead of turning a blind eye. Uh, if you look at uh, going back to the Biden administration's North Korea policy, as I mentioned earlier, it emphasizes uh, diplomacy and it also honors uh, the previous administration's accomplishments. However, as I mentioned earlier, it still lacks novelty and uh, real and substantive changes. It seems uh, they are going to focus on working level talks. But if you look at the policies uh, that they have put forth, you cannot really find uh, flexibility uh, because Biden's uh, North Korea policies still emphasizes sanctions and pressure on North Korea as well as military deterrence. So it seems that uh, the new administration has not accepted or learned 
uh, lessons uh, from the Hanoi summit, and they are simply revisiting existing policies. I believe we are at a critical juncture in overcoming the current stalemate. I believe the way to maintain stability, to break the stalemate and resume dialogue is to seek solutions and answers in reality based on past experiences. Allow me to share my thoughts on this last point. We must firmly pursue a political solution. I believe that uh, the joint statements and declarations in the past must be honored and implemented. I think that is the way forward. Uh, of course, uh, the Panmunjom Declaration is one uh, such document that must be implemented. I think that based on these previous accomplishments, we must uh, carry forward uh, the dialogue. In the past, concerned parties sought fruitful outcome by pursuing a political solution through dialogue. These attempts failed largely due to a lack of mutual trust among the parties and constant confrontations. Uh, if you look at the situation right now, the North has uh, ma taken some actions, but still uh, the sanctions have uh, not been lifted. And I believe that it falls on uh, the U.S. Uh, to take a larger role in uh, trying to resume the talks by showing a more sincere attitude. Uh, they have called on uh, North Korea to return to the dialogue table. Uh, and they have expressed a willingness to engage in dialogue. However, if they continue uh, to put maximum pressure on North Korea, uh, North Korea uh, has naturally can be skeptical about the sincerity uh, of the U.S. If you look at uh, North Korea, as mentioned earlier, they have taken measures for denuclearization and they have stopped uh, nuclear and missile tests. And they also expressed willingness to do away with the missile launch pads in Dongchangni. So, however, this all of this was not met with a very active uh, U.S. response. And the U.S. seems to think that the U, uh, North Korea uh, needs to take more sincere, significant measures. In the past couple of years, I think there was progress because there was an agreement to build a peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but all of these agreements have yet to be implemented. But it seems uh, the U.S. is simply requiring and demanding that the North do more when the U.S. is not willing to budge. So I think it is commendable that the U.S. is calling on the North for dialogue, but the U.S. must also take some steps or measures to show North Korea that it is willing to implement uh, uh, some items uh, on the agreement. And as I mentioned earlier, I believe all concerned parties need to hear uh, the reasonable interest and concerns of uh, North Korea. Uh, we must also stick with our parallel approach as well as the principle of a phased and simultaneous approach. Uh, this spirit is very well expressed in the September 19th Joint Statement and the Singapore Joint Statement. Given the complexity and the uniqueness of uh, the situation, I believe that we need a roadmap in which all concerned parties can deal with the concerned interest in a balanced manner. And we need a roadmap that can solidify feasible outcomes and build on the outcomes to create an environment to fundamentally resolve the issues on the Korean Peninsula. And I think the U.S. should lead the way in reviewing and establishing such a roadmap. China focuses and emphasizes uh, resolving uh, the issue in a balanced manner. This means that the interests of the concerned parties are dealt with equally. The reality is that many parties lack the trust. And so we need a phased and simultaneous approach to the issue. Of course, before this, we need to build more confidence. 
and we also need to build on the consensus uh, that has been formed, and we need to solidify the previous agreements, and we need to fix the agreements of the past and create an environment where we can move forward from these past agreements. And I also believe that the two Koreas must pursue reconciliation and cooperation. China has always supported the two Koreas in this matter and has always spared no effort to cooperate. Uh, the inter-Korean dialogues are being stalled, but uh, I believe that resuming dialogues is a first step towards uh, building peace on the Korean Peninsula. We need to improve inter-Korean relations because it is closely related to peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so I believe that U.S. Uh, North Korea talks can serve as a catalyst for better inter-Korean relations. And of course, in that sense, South Korea and uh, the U.S. need to more closely cooperate and engage in consultation. Uh, we have seen uh, that uh, the past few years have been tough for inter-Korean dialogue. Connections were cut, then restored, and we have seen a repetition of such pattern. I hope the two Koreas firmly pursue their national cause and independence and continue to pursue reconciliation and cooperation. Also, bilateral and multilateral dialogue must continue. Uh, the Korean Peninsula issue is uh, very complicated, and uh, many different national interests of concerned parties are interrelated. Uh, so the effort of all concerned parties are needed to, to find a way through. Uh, the participants here have uh, experience in engaging in six-party talks. And uh, we know that the bilateral and multilateral uh, channels are very important. And we can have a smaller uh, four-way talks as well. So what I'm trying to say is uh, that uh, Dialogue must be supported now, and smaller multilateral dialogue in various forms should be held within a broader six-party framework. I believe the six-party talks was by far the most effective multilateral platform in dealing with uh, the peninsula issue. We must continue dialogue between the inter two Koreas. And we must also promote uh, different forms of dialogue within uh, the six-party framework. As I mentioned earlier, we can hold smaller multilateral dialogues in various forms within the six-party framework. And if it would work, it would, I think, be meaningful to revive the six-party talks as well. Uh, depending on the different situation and the environment, we need uh, different ways and flexible ways to move forward the negotiations regarding the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ning Fu Kui talked about resolving the issue in a balanced uh, manner. And he also talked about how we need to take interest in the concerns of North Korea. And uh, in particular, he talked about uh, the efforts for reconciliation and cooperation on the part of the two Koreas. He emphasized this point uh, greatly. Lastly, we would like to invite Mr. Joseph Dutrani for his comments. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to uh, be invited to the uh, Korea Global Forum for Peace. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about the subject, and, and, and uh, let me just say this. It's, it's also an honor being here with so many uh, friends and colleagues who have worked on this issue for a number of years. So uh, I, I think we're all in the same situation looking for a path to a peaceful resolution of issues with North Korea. So I, I commend all of you for the work you continue to do. And it's, again, it's an honor being here with all of you. Let me just speak to the, the, uh, the topic for this evening, challenges and opportunities for peace, for the peace process. Let me focus on the opportunities before we talk about the challenges. And I think all of you spoke eloquently about many of the challenges and, and also opportunities, but I, let me start with opportunities. 
Let me start with the lessons we've learned from not only 27 years of negotiations with North Korea, but let me just take it back to 2005, further to what Ambassador Ning Fu Kuei was saying a few minutes ago about the six-party talks. On September, and, and, and certainly Ambassador Lee and others were all very intimate with that six-party process, which I thought was very effective. With the September 19, 2005 joint statement, we had from North Korea a commitment to dismantle all nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons facilities. That's very clear. This was Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un's father saying, we are committed to basically complete verifiable denuclearization. The terminology we use was, used was dismantle all nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons facilities. Made it very clear. It was an action for action basis. And it was giving assurances to North Korea that they would get the security assurances, the economic development assistance. And also coming back to the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state, a prospects for uh, the provision of light water reactors for civilian nuclear energy. That's a very powerful package that was negotiated with North Korea. It took over two years of negotiations with North Korea. So I think that's a seminal event in, in, my, in my estimation. It spoke to the leadership in North Korea saying, we're prepared to dismantle our nuclear weapons and our facilities, uh, but we need assurances. And it was actions for actions, commitments for commitments. You know, this was followed in 2018 with the meeting, the summit between President Moon Jae-in and Chairman Kim Jong-un with the Panmunjom Declaration that spoke of peace and reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula. And indeed, it was that summit that facilitated the September, with the, the June 2018 Singapore summit between former President Donald Trump and Chairman Kim Jong-un that resulted in a joint statement, which again committed North Korea to complete verifiable, if you will, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but also a process to transform our relationship. And I'll go back to the 2005 joint statement. That was an integral part of that joint statement, movement towards a normal relationship between the respective countries, between the United States and North Korea, but also between, if you will, the ROK and the DPRK in regards to total reconciliation inter Korean relations coming together again with the ultimate goal of unification. So again, here we have the Singapore joint statement of 2018 that spoke of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but also transformation of our relationship, but a peace treaty to finally end the Korean War to bring peace to the Korean Peninsula. That's significant. There was a lot of talk about, and I think correctly so, about the Hanoi summit and its failure. Well, it, 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 we knew going back to 2005, when we spoke of actions for actions, commitments for commitments. When Kim Jong-un put the, the Yongbyon facility on the table, that was the beginning of a process. Uh, there were a lot of other issues there, but that was the beginning of a process. What the, the United States position was, but we need to talk about other facilities besides Yongbyon, the highly enriched uranium facilities. And that was, that was a bridge too far at that time for, for Kim Jong-un. <clears throat> now, that's a lesson learned. That's a lesson learned. And we, we have to, if, if we want to move forward and get some progress on a peaceful resolution, it's not going to be in one full swoop. It's not going to be a Libya. It's not going to be give up all your nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons facilities and your missiles and chemical, biological, et cetera, in return for... It's got to be the, the roadmap that was mentioned a few minutes ago. And we, we, I think it's understood. So we learned something certainly in 2005 that North Korea was prepared to dismantle their nuclear weapons and facilities in 2018 uh, with the Panmunjom Declaration, reconciliation, peace and reconciliation with, with the ROK and with uh, former President Donald Trump in June of 2018, transformation of a relationship so that we can come together again, peace on the peninsula and denuclearization. Those, those, are, those are important. And also in, 
in 2021, the summit between President Moon Jae-in and, and President Joe Biden spoke about the Korean Peninsula in, in many, many details, with many details, but also talked about inter-Korean relations, inter-Korean relations, the need to for the, the South to engage with the North on, on humanitarian issues, on economic issues, and, and to move forward. And I think that was, that was very significant, I think, on the, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a takeaway from that, that summit between the two presidents. Because here the U.S. was telling the Republic of Korea, President Moon Jae-in, go ahead with the inter-Korean relations. Reestablish that dialogue. Move forward. There's a humanitarian uh, issue here in, in, in vivid terms with North Korea because of significant malnourishment, uh, which, is, which has been a pervasive issue in the North, but other issues that speak to a humanitarian uh, uh, assistance uh, but also economic development assistance. So that could be anything reconstituting the Kaesong Industrial Complex, whether it's uh, bringing uh, on a humanitarian basis, the, fam- the separated families from the Korean War, visits to Mount Kumgang, uh, was mentioned by uh, Dr. Moon, uh, connecting the, the rail lines between the North and South. There are many opportunities here in the inter-Korean side. And, and, and I just... I just have to focus on that because I, I think that's a piece that's so important. Well, we can talk about getting North Korea back to negotiations and, and certainly looking to China and looking to Russia, given their very unique relationship with the deep PRK, to encourage Kim Jong-un and, and his leadership to come back to negotiations so that we can come up with a roadmap and we can talk about a process that will lend itself to providing the deliverables to North Korea that, that they correctly have demanded, security assurances, lifting of sanctions, uh, a path to a normal relationship, economic development assistance, uh, peaceful uh, nuclear energy, a sovereign right to put satellites in all. These are issues that should be put on the table and need to be put on the table, but we need to come back to talk. So so I, I would, I would I, obviously, uh, the. Uh, Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China are doing their best, but but the most the more you can do to get North Korea to come back to these negotiations, but also for the Republic of Korea, uh, the opportunity to really re-engage on the inter-Korean issue. On on we, uh, Dr. Moon mentioned the Kaesong Industrial Complex and, and others, the rail lines, uh, visits the confidence building that will come with the uh, separated families coming together again, visits to Mount Kungang, et cetera. There's a, there's a, there's a myriad of issues that are, that are there and, and available that would, that would open uh, opportunities. So uh, those are opportunities. And we saw that in 2005. I think we saw it in 2018. And we saw it in 2021. These are opportunities, insights. The challenges are clear. I don't think there's anyone who's been following North Korea in the United States who believes North Korea is prepared to comprehensively and verifiably denuclearize. Ladies and gentlemen, let's be candid about that. That is going against the current. When people talk about denuclearization, people say, no, 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 no. 27 years of negotiation is not possible. I think many of us who have been in negotiations with North Korea, and I cite the joint statement of 2005, the 2018 uh, Panmunjom Declaration, the Singapore joint statement, uh, as, as indicative of the fact that not only Kim Jong-il, but Kim Jong-un has, has committed to denuclearization. And there was, there was movement there, but there is such uh, skepticism that that, that, is, uh, that is a poss- that's even a likelihood Never mind a possibility. A likelihood is, 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 is sort of remote. So we have to get something going. There needs to be some momentum in it. it and I, I personally believe it's the inter-Korean piece to the equation. And that's why I think this Korea Global Forum on, on, uh, for Peace discussion of challenges and opportunities for the peace process is, is so timely because there's a window of opportunity here. 
where you also have the United States encouraging the Republic of Korea, move forward on inter-Korean relations, get that going. And I think certainly we're hearing that from, from, uh, from uh, the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation also, just, just get that going. And I think there would be overall support. Secondly, and it was mentioned, Alexander and, and, and all of you have mentioned the other aspect to it about uh, denuclearization is a key issue, but it's not just an issue for the United States. This is obviously an issue for the Republic of Korea, but, but also for the People's Republic of China, the Russian Federation, for Japan, for the region. So that's why the six party talks, and I agree with Ambassador Ni Fu Kui, had, had, uh, had such traction because it was, it was bringing together uh, a myriad of countries in, intimate with, uh, with the issue of denuclearization and with the, with, the, with, with, with the realization that North Korea with nuclear weapons would lend itself to instability. And that's my personal view, instability in the region, whether it's proliferation, whether it's the uh, nuclear arms race with other countries seeking nuclear weapons, et cetera. And I, and I think given that we've seen a commitment on the part of Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un to, to move forward with denuclearization, let's move forward. Now, should we re- try to reconstitute the six-party process? Whatever, whatever works. But I think the, the ball is really in the court of North Korea and the United States right now to get at least that dialogue going at that level. If it should open up, because it was North Korea... I'd like to remind our colleagues who in in early 2009 said they would not come back to a six-party process. So it's one thing for us to be speculating on that, but we need to hear from North Korea on that, uh, where where they would be going. So so whether it's four-party talks, whether it's five-party talks, whether it's reconstituting the six-party process, but indeed getting some, some, some momentum on that. And indeed a roadmap so that North Korea understands uh, no one is going to be insisting on, uh, you know, a complete verifiable denuclearization at the first meeting. No one's going to be saying, well, you give everything up and then we'll talk about lifting sanctions and security assurances, et cetera. And, and again, it, it, it brings me right back to the joint statement September 2005, where it was actions for ac- actions, commitments for commitments. So, so there are so many lessons we've learned in this uh, 27 years, but I'm only talking between 20, 2005 and, two, and, and 2021, a shorter period of time, 17 years that we've learned from negotiating with North Korea. So we should not give up on this issue, obviously. And, and, and the inter-Korean peace is the, is, is the uh, in my estimation, uh, the most viable initial approach right now, getting some momentum there and then getting North Korea to sit down with the, initially certainly with the United States, to talk about a roadmap where North Korea can table the issues that they're talking about. And I mentioned some of them, you all mentioned some. But to include also peaceful nuclear, that was always a big issue. Because we have to remember the Korea Energy Development Organization, going back to the six-party process and before that. We were building two light water reactors at Kung Ho, North Korea, for, for, for North Korea and providing them with heavy fuel oil in the process. And that was based on the agreed framework. So a commitment here, and that came out in, again, September 2005, of a, a dialogue to reconstitute uh, the, the, uh, the provision of light water reactors as they come back to the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state. So the challenges are significant. Uh, snapbacks, obviously put on the table. Uh, they're, they're all there, but that would be uh, that would be a good series of meetings at a very senior but working level meeting or meetings with North Korean counterparts, people who, who follow it and who have the, who have the uh, confidence of uh, Kim Jong-un and, and are responding to his, uh, his, uh, his wishes in this process. So uh, I commend the uh, Korea Global Forum for Peace to have this discussion today and I'll end on the note of, uh, I, I, uh, again, repeating uh, what the President Moon Jae-in has been pursuing for some time. I think the opportunity now is, 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 is really there for a, a momentum on the inter-Korean peace.
to this, this bigger issue of complete verifiable denuclearization. Because it's only the inter-Korean peace that will lend itself to eventual reunification of the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ditrani, he talked about the importance of the resumption of negotiations and also about the importance of inner Korean talks and the need to create a momentum uh, for negotiation between the two Koreas. So we now have 15 minutes left. Many people are viewing this session via online, and although the time left for us is very short, if you have any questions, uh, perhaps you can leave them on the online platform and we can address them. Do, do we have any questions that came up? So, Mr. Moon, uh, perhaps you could give us some further comments? I completely agree with uh, Ambassador Joseph Detrani. We tend to focus on the challenges and not the opportunities. I agree with his uh, view. I think uh, peace on the Korean Peninsula is hostage uh, to the North Korea nuclear situation. Uh, the Pyongyang summit and the Panmunjom summit, I was there. And I, th I believe that the North Korean leadership does have an intention and will to denuclearize. The problem is that uh, uh, it are the conditions and terms. And uh, the US and North Korea do not see eye to eye on the terms and conditions. I believe uh, the U.S. Uh, lacks uh, the attitude of seeing the issue from the other side. And I also think there is a lack of appreciation, appreciation for practicality. President Trump uh, said that if North Korea does away with all its nuclear weapons and facilities first, then it will guarantee a bright economic future. And I think from North Korea's perspective, uh, this was not realistic and not practical. So I believe that the U.S. needs to come up with more realistic and practical uh, measures. And as I mentioned, uh, was mentioned by Mr. Lee, uh, the U.S. needs new perspective on North Korea. Uh, North Korea is demonized in, North, in the U.S., and uh, the sentiment, of course, is uh, then shared. As uh, mentioned by Ambassador Dechani, he talked about the lessons that were learned from our past experience. I think the man has never learned the lessons. Lessons are there. They're not willing to learn the lessons. It's like uh, Afghanistan. For 20 years, American commanders in Kabul prepared the war plan every year for 20 years. Therefore, in other words, in other words, if you look at uh, the North Korea issue, and uh, North Korea issue is uh, inextricably linked uh, to the security issue of the Korean Peninsula and uh, Northeast Asia. Uh, we uh, can deal only with various issues uh, in this uh, framework. I think we have lost sight of the bigger framework, and uh, we are constantly in confrontation over various different components. I think when it comes to sanctions, I believe that the U.S. needs to take a bold approach. And also, the Panmunjom Declaration uh, 
deals with the uh, end of war statement and also a peace accord. And we need to make progress here. And we also need to foster inter-Korean cooperation. Uh, there are many items where we can cooperate on. And although the current president uh, does not have much time left in his tenure, I believe that we need to engage in inter-Korean dialogue uh, on uh, some of these uh, topics. And we need to aim for small success. I think the problem with the current administration is that they have failed in breeding more small successes. And I think so in that sense, uh, South Korea needs to be practical and seek uh, small successes first. We don't have a lot of time left for some specific discussions. But Ambassador Ditrani and Ambassador Fukui, I'd like to give both of you a short question. So negotiations are stalled at the moment. And to make a breakthrough, you propose some various ways and also emphasize the importance of inter-Korean talks. And you also emphasize the importance of multilateral talks, like the former six-party talks. But at a time when the U.S. and China are engaged in a strategic confrontation, the North Korean nuclear issue uh, is being impacted because we know from experience from the six-party talks that U.S. and China's cooperation is very important for resolving North Korea nuclear issue. Uh, but you know, in this situation, to what extent can North Korea, uh, sorry, China and U.S. cooperate? And given this current situation, can you talk about the possibility and the necessity of that? Uh, Ambassador Ning Kufui, please. Uh, thank you for the question. I think you raised a very important question. In the past and today, U.S. and China have uh, maintained uh, cooperation and communication. Personally, I took part in the four-party talks on two occasions, and uh, Joseph Detrani uh, was part of the six-party talks, and I think that I communicated and collaborated well with him as well. The U.S. and China I believe, have shared interest in seeing a peaceful, nuclear-free, stable Korean Peninsula. So the, inter the Korean Peninsula issue is at a uh, stalemate. And in this situation, I think that it's difficult to engage in efficient uh, dialogue between uh, DPRK, the U.S., and China and the U.S. If you look at the international community at large, I think they play an important role in encouraging dialogue between the different parties. But I think that there is an issue with U.S.-China relations at this point. Uh, China seeks to expand cooperation with the U.S. I think it has stated its uh, willingness on numerous occasions. But the problem is that uh, the U.S.'s uh, China policy continues to be one of pressure and sanctions. Uh, the U.S. criticizes China's intervention in other countries, and it's uh, quite critical of China at this point. And uh, against this backdrop, how can uh, U.S.-China cooperate? I believe that China has been uh, unwavered in its uh, stance that it will cooperate with the U.S. Then how can we foster cooperation once again? I believe the ball is in the U.S. court. We need mutual respect between the two parties, and based on this mutual respect, 
uh, we can cooperate on the issue at hand. In order for the U.S. and China to engage in close consultation, I have to say that currently the ball is in uh, the U.S. court. Over to you, Mr. Detroni. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, look, let me say uh, China was instrumental in the six-party talks. I think, you know, uh, Ambassador uh, Ding Fu Kui is, is correct. The, uh, we cooperated so well together. Certainly Foreign Minister, uh, State Councilor Wang Yi, who led the uh, six-party process, did just a masterful job working with uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Ning, and, but also with uh, Fu Ying and, and, and Ambassador Fu Ying and others. And there was such close collaboration, and it was powerful. I think the international community would be looking to the United States and China to resume that sort of cooperation. So as to resolve issues like the North Korean nuclear issue, I think there, I think, I think there would be lots of, uh, there is lots of concern and, and lots of uh, hope there that the U.S. and China can come together. And I think I, my personal view is, I tend to be optimistic on this, I think we will come together to work this issue because it's, it's in our mutual interests. I don't think it's in anyone's interest to see North Korea continue with its nuclear and missile programs, with the possibility of proliferation, et cetera, and what that brings to the, what brings to the region and the world. So this could be uh, a template, if you will, where the U.S. and China shows the world that there may be some trade issues here, there may be some issues related to whether it's the South China Sea or what have you. Well, that, this is diplomacy. This is where diplomats come together to talk about the issues. But there are also a myriad of issues where we need to cooperate it on, cooperate on to include North Korea, whether it be pandemics, counterproliferation, counterterrorism, et cetera, but certainly the North Korean issue. And we have a history of cooperating on the North Korean issue. So I think this is something we, we, uh, we, we need to do. And I think this is something that uh, our respective leaders would want to do. And, and our, the citizens in our respective countries would expect our leaders to be moving in this direction so that we can get some momentum. So I, I tend to believe that we will uh, come together and, and work. Uh, uh, I, I'm not saying similar to what we did in the six party talks. It's a different construct now, but come together to realize that we, we need to cooperate on this issue because letting, letting it fester, uh, pursuing whether it's strategic patience or what have you, letting North Korea build more nuclear weapons and, and, and missile delivery systems and, and other programs is not in anyone's interest. And I, I think it's not also in North Korea's interest, nor the people of North Korea, because they need to come back into the fold as a legitimate nation state that's leading, that's lending itself to good cooperation with the Republic of Korea and eventual reunification. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wish uh, we had more time for more questions and discussions. Unfortunately, it is time for us to wrap up this uh, session. As I listen to the comments uh, of our panelists uh, today, I think uh, we can draw around uh, three conclusions uh, of what was discussed today. Uh, perhaps uh, three uh, elements in which we can agree upon. First, is uh, the importance of uh, trust building and confidence building. In order to resume uh, talks and in the process of resolving the problem, uh, we need to think hard about how we can build uh, trust. And uh, we also need to find a way and think deep and hard about how we're going to resolve the mistrust that has accumulated over the years. And it, this seems to be a very important point in moving forward uh, the broader process. Uh, this has been echoed by our uh, panelists. And the second point is that the stalemate is becoming protracted uh, since uh, the Hanoi summit fell apart. 
And uh, if the stalemate continues as time passes by, uh, we will face a more difficult uh, situation and a more complicated situation. If we look at the negotiating environment, Compared to the past, I think the issue has become more complex and the environment itself has become more complex. However, if the stalemate continues, it is with certainty that we can say that the negotiations uh, will become uh, even harder. And I think that is a sentiment shared by our panelists uh, here today. And uh, the third is the USDPRK. Uh, the dialogue between the U.S. and DPRK is important, uh, but inter-Korean dialogue is uh, equally, if not more important. In order to resume talks between the DPRK and the U.S., uh, inter-Korean talks are important. And as the two main actors of this situation, it is important for the two Koreas to resume dialogue, to move forward their relationship and cooperate. And this is an important element not only for the Korean Peninsula, but also the broader Northeast Asia region. So inter-Korean relations, uh, we need to improve inter-Korean relations uh, as soon as possible. And I think that uh, this was something Something that all our panelists agreed upon as well. I would like to thank uh, the five uh, panelists for taking part in this session once again. And with that, we would like to conclude uh, this session. Thank you very much.